title of my sermon this morning is, you know, what, what happens to you when you die or what's going to happen when you die. And it's a real basic sermon, but I just, you know, we got to go over the fundamentals uh, from time to time and make sure that, that we don't lose our grip on, on just the real basics of the faith. And um, it's an interesting topic to, to study, and it's one that I think a lot of people have questions about in general. It's one of the reasons why we go out soul winning and we go out preaching the gospel is to help people understand, hey, what's going to happen when you die? There's a lot of different ideas about that, but thankfully we have the Bible to tell us what the truth is about everything. Now, Keep your place here in Romans 3. I just want to have you turn real quick to Matthew chapter number 7. Because the first concept that we're going to get past here, and if you only got your idea of what happens to a person after they die from going to funerals, you probably think that everybody goes to heaven. Now, I understand why at a funeral, you know, there, no one's going to talk about someone going to hell. That's not very comforting for the, the people who are, who are left at, uh, you know, behind and, and no one wants to think about their loved ones, you know, potentially being in hell and being suffered and being in torment. But there are many people who do think that when you die, just basically whatever heaven is in their mind or, you know, just something good in the afterlife that everybody is just going to pass on to something better. Okay, and that's not the case, and that's not what the Bible teaches. Uh, if you look at Matthew chapter 7, verse number 13, the Bible says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. And that word straight there means it's narrow. It's not a difference between straight and crooked. It just means it's narrow. <laughs> Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. So the Bible is saying, you know, there's many ways. that The path to destruction is very wide, and many, many, many people take that path. Many people end up in destruction. Verse 14 says, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The Bible is very, very clearly telling us, Jesus Christ himself is telling us in Matthew 7, that there's few people that are saved. In regards to, now obviously, this is relative because there's many that are go to destruction and few that are saved. So it doesn't mean that there's few like a handful in the entire history of mankind. But relatively speaking, when you think about all the people who exist on the, on the earth at any given moment, many of those people will end up taking the path to destruction, whereas few will end up taking the path that leads to light. And the reason why is because, hey, the, the gate is wide to destruction. There's many ways to be destroyed. There's many options. There's many religions out there. There's many gods out there to follow. Broad is the way. They all will end up to destruction. But see, the way to life is narrow. There's only one way to life. There's not many ways to life. It's not follow your truth. It's not be the best person you could be in whatever area you were raised and whatever God you were raised to serve. That's not, that's a broad way. Okay? The way is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's why the way is narrow. That's why it's straight, as the Bible says here, S-T-R-A-I-T, -E because it's only through Jesus Christ. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. You have to go through Jesus Christ. If you don't have Jesus Christ, you cannot be saved. Romans chapter 3, go back to Romans 3 where we started. And what I love about Romans 3 is that you essentially have the gospel in just, you know, a, a short passage here in Romans chapter 3. You could give the gospel to someone, I believe, from Romans chapter 3. And um, there's definitely enough here to show people what salvation is all about. And, you know, the title of the sermon is, What Happens When You Die? Well, what happens when you die is that you're either going to go to heaven or hell. There's no other choice. It's heaven or hell. And it's not even, once you die, it's not a choice anymore. Right. 
And we're going to get into that a little bit more. But first, I just want to start off by going through the gospel because this is the most important thing that anybody needs to know is if you want to be saved, if you want to have a good outcome, if you want to have positivity after you die here on earth, then you better listen up and pay attention to the gospel because broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many people end up being destroyed in hell for eternity. It's not being annihilated and you're gone. The destruction continues forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and, ever and it never ends. Look at verse number 19 in Romans chapter 3. The Bible reads, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. You see, God, the God that, that created everything, the God of this world, the God, the only God, the one and true God, the holy living God, created everything and he made laws. He made laws for mankind to follow and instructed man on what those laws were and are. And he's even given us, as part of his creation, consciences to be able to understand and even feel when we do wrong. He's given us a guide. He's giving us a, a, a direction, even internally, but more importantly, externally in the form of his word and the instruction of his prophets, where he's created a law but the problem with the law for us is that we've all become guilty before God, before a holy God, a just God. We're all guilty because we've all sinned. We've all transgressed God's law. We've all done things contrary to God's law. And when you break God's law, he has a, a penalty for your sin. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. That is God's penalty. Look at verse number 20 there in Romans 3. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So basically, the Bible says that by the deeds of the law, by, by keeping the law, by doing the good things that are found in the law, no flesh is justified in God's eyes. So the way that I used to think, the way that many people still think today is that, hey, I'm a pretty good person. I'm going to go to a good place when I die. I'm pretty good. I mean, I haven't done anything that bad. I never murdered anybody. I've never raped anybody, you know. And this is a real common thought. I'm pretty good. But the problem is that we're all guilty before God. Amen. See, everyone wants to think about the good things that they've done and forget about the bad things that you've done. But here's the thing. God doesn't forget. There's only one way for God to grant forgiveness for your sins. And it's not just based on how good you are. The Bible says that, the, that no flesh is justified by you keeping the deeds of the law. That will not get you justified because you've already fallen short. You've already failed at keeping the law. And once you become a breaker of the law... You, you deserve a penalty. You deserve a punishment. But there's good news. The bad news is that we're all guilty before God. We're all guilty because we've broken the law. But the good news is that, in verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So that God offers us righteousness. He offers us to be able to be in a state of, of being completely sinless of being completely forgiven and washed, have all the sins washed away, and it doesn't have to do with keeping the law. Because we've already fallen short of that. We can't do that, and it's manifested. It says being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So even the very law and the prophets have all witnessed of this righteousness that God offers that is set apart and separate from the law. The Bible says in verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. And that's the key. The righteousness that comes without works. The being justified in God's sight 
without being, having to keep the law comes by the faith of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Savior that died for you on the cross. He paid for your sins. He, he descended into hell for three days and three nights, rose again from the dead. That same Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God incarnate, to pay for your sins, faith on Him. All them that believe on Him receive the righteousness of God. They receive that righteousness from God. The righteousness that Jesus had gets imputed unto you just by putting your trust in Him. And this is something that God offered up. Okay, this is for part of God's plan. Man can't make that up. Man can't take that or steal that on their own. God gave this. That's why it's grace. It's a gift. It's something that because God loves you, He made this option available to you. And I'll tell you what, it's the only option because if you try to stand on your own works of righteousness, what's going to happen to you when you die is you're going to go to a lake of fire. You're going to go to a hell fire that, has, that burns forever and ever and, and the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. Verse 23 says, uh, for, the, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. See, we're justified freely. It's not something that you've earned or merited. It's free. You've been justified for free by His grace. Verse 25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. And again, it's through faith in His blood, the Bible says there in verse 25. Verse 26, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. Notice again, Verse 26, the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. He doesn't justify everybody. He only justifies those that believe. Now, how many times, even in these few short verses up to this point, have we seen it's by faith, it's by believing? <laughs> faith, believe. At least three times we've seen that, that that is who is justified before God. Look at verse 27. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Why is boasting excluded? How is it that you're able to boast? The word boast means to brag. You could brag about the things that you've done. Right? Hey, if you, start, if you go off this whole week and you just help people out, you do good things, you're, you're, you're keeping God's law, you're doing all this stuff, you could brag about that. Why? So I'm doing all this stuff and you're not. Right? I mean, isn't that what people are going to do if you, if you brag about things? But see, God's saying boasting is excluded. You can't boast. Why can't you boast? Because it's not based on how good you are. Your righteousness, being justified before God, isn't based on how good you are. He's saying because you're all guilty. You're all sinners. You can't brag about that. You can't brag about some gift that someone gives you. Right. If it's truly just a gift, if it's not based on your own merits, that's what a gift is. It's not based on how good you are. Which, by the way, you know, Christmas is right around the corner. It's one of the things I hate the most about Santa Claus is the, is the shifting of the concept of, you know, oh, be good and you'll get gifts. No, you get gifts because we love you. We give gifts because Jesus Christ died for you. A gift is something that you receive because someone loves you. It's not something you've earned or merited. That's not a gift. When I pay my kids to do chores, that's, that's earned. When I have work for them to do and then I give them money or something in return, and if they don't do the work, they don't get the money, that's earned. Okay, gifts are not something to be earned. There's something that's given because you love someone. Otherwise, it's not a gift. That's why boasting is excluded. You can't boast about something that you didn't work for, that you didn't do, that someone just handed you. You can't brag about that. The only thing you can brag about is brag on the person who gave it to you. Brag on the person who loved you enough to give it to you for free. You can't brag on yourself. 
Boasting is excluded. And I love verse 28 because this is just unequivocal. There's a lot of people out there say, oh yeah, you got to believe, but you also have these works. You got to have, you, know, you still got to do something good. You still have to do this or do that. Verse 28 says, therefore we conclude. So what's the conclusion? We conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Maybe you didn't understand everything that was read up to this point, but you know what? Verse number 28, there's the conclusion for you. The conclusion of everything that was already just stated previously is that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So how do you get justified? Is it faith plus works? Is it faith but follow Jesus the best you can? Is it faith and, and live a good life and help people out and go to church? No, that's not how you're justified. You're justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Amen. The deeds of the law don't help you get justified. If you need the deeds of the law to be justified, then what you're saying is that what Jesus Christ did for you is not enough. That's pretty blasphemous, my friend. If you could play a role in your own salvation by being good enough and adding your own works, that's a slap in the face to what Jesus Christ did when He came to this earth, lived a perfectly sinless life, performed all the miracles, did all the work that He's supposed to do. He did always those things that were pleasing in the Father's sight. Always. Can you say the same thing? There's a big difference. There's a big difference in a sacrifice that someone makes you know, if you or I were to make a sacrifice as sinners, we're t it's tainted, it's tarnished, it's just not quite as good. We faltered and failed and, and don't have that great reputation and don't have that, that sterling, perfect example. We already deserve to be punished. We can't go ahead now and turn around and pay for someone else's sins. Jesus Christ was perfect in every sense of the word. He never felt a temptation. He did everything right. That wasn't an easy job. Yes, he was God, but he was still God in the flesh. He understood what it was to be a man. He understood the temptations that we face. He understood the physical dependencies and requirements that we have in this life and all the, the, the influences that you could have on your life and all the wicked people out there are going to try to make you get into sin. He experienced that. He experienced attack from Satan himself trying to get him to sin. And he didn't do it. And he didn't falter. And he didn't waver. And he did everything right. And if it meant staying up all night in prayer and walking all day and going from town to town and not having a place to sleep, he did always those things that were righteous. Always before allowing himself to be humiliated and mocked and beaten and bloodied to a pulp and nailed to a cross, which is a cursed thing, which is despised and looked down upon to be nailed to a cross to hang up there and die. And he did all of that for you. But somehow you think that wasn't enough. That's just not quite enough. I still need to do something else to save myself. You don't value what Jesus did for you. No, all of your faith has to be in Jesus Christ. Flip over to Romans chapter 4. Just because it continues on, Romans 3 to Romans 4, continues on the same thought about concluding, hey, a man's justified by faith without the deeds of the law. You don't need the deeds of the law to be saved at all. It's just the faith. Now, should we do good things after you're saved? Of course you should. But that's not what saves you. There's no part in your salvation. It's separate. Romans 4 verse 4 says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. When you get rewarded for working, that's a debt that's owed unto you. When you're working for someone, they owe you something. They owe you something in return for your labor, for your service. That's not grace. Verse 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Unto him that worketh not. person who doesn't work, but they have faith. Is that possible? Well, according to the Bible, it says that they're justified. Looks possible to me. Even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man. Remember in Romans chapter 3, it was talking about that it was prophesied of, of the law and the prophets. David being one of those prophets. David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Hey, it's a blessed thing to have righteousness imputed unto you without you doing any good works. 
Because that's, that's the way it does work. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Look at this. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Does that mean the person just completely stops sinning? No, but God's not going to impute the sin unto them anymore because they put their trust in Jesus Christ because Jesus paid for their sins. The sin was paid for by Jesus Christ, so God is not going to impute that sin unto them. This is the only way it even works for anybody to be saved because after you get saved, after you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you're still a sinner. You still sin. And I'm sorry, point out the person who doesn't sin to me and I'll show you the person who doesn't believe the Bible. Because if you think that you're not sinning and you could just go months and years and whatever without sinning, you don't know the Bible at all. You don't know the Bible for squat. Try reading the law. Try reading Proverbs. Try reading the scriptures that talk about, you know, even the thought of foolishness is sin. The thoughts and intents of your hearts and your mind. You mean to tell me you've got every single one of those under control at all times, you liar? And the problem with trying to keep the law is that if you, don't, if you fail in any of the points, you're still guilty. That's right. You need grace. You need a Savior. You need to put your trust in a Savior that forgives you of all of your sins. If you don't have that, the rest of my sermon is a moot point. You want to know what's going to happen when you die? You don't have to know all the details as long as you know that Christ is your Savior. Now, we're going to get into some of the details here. But you need to make sure that your home is established in heaven. It's not something that you can lose. It's not something that's based on how good you are. It's the only reason why we can know confidently with assurance, hey, I know 100% for sure that whatever day I die, I'm going to heaven. Amen. That doesn't make me proud. That doesn't make me arrogant. That doesn't make me boastful. And the reason why is because I'm not trusting in my works. There's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of false religions that say, oh, if you say that you know for sure you're going to heaven, then you are just super arrogant and full of yourself. The reason why they think that is because they're trusting in their works. If we got saved by how good we were, then that would be an arrogant thing to think. Well, how could you, how could you think that you don't even know the future and you think that you're going to be so good that you're going to make it to heaven? That would be an arrogant concept if that's the way salvation worked. But the problem is that's not how it works. It works because it's not based on me. So I can tell you right now, I'm going to continue to sin. I'm not saying it's like I want to. It's just a fact. Because I know I'm not perfect. And I know that nobody is perfect. And people could put on a big front, but you know what? God knows your, your heart. God knows your thoughts. Oh, how bad we need a Savior Amen. that saves us and keeps us. Amen. You were never good enough to get it on your own. You're not good enough to keep it. Right. It's not like God could just bring you up to a certain point and be like, okay, now you're on your own. Now, you got it. now just from here on out, just live perfect. Good luck with that. You're in, a, you're in just as much of need in a condition as you were before you put your trust in Christ. You need Him to save you permanently, to give you eternal life. So we can take God at His word and say, hey, you know what? It is eternal. I am saved forever. That's some good news. But let's look at the Bible here. Turn, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. What happens when you die? You don't want to find out if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Savior. The only way to life is through Jesus Christ. 
But there's, there's two false doctrines in particular that we're going to be debunking as we look at what the Bible says. Okay? One of those is the concept of soul sleep. Soul sleep teaches that when you die... Basically, you know, obviously your body is going to be buried or whatever is done to your body is done. But people teach that your soul just remains in a state of, of unconsciousness and you're just asleep in the ground until the resurrection happens, until Jesus Christ comes back. So this is a teaching that, uh, that, is, that has been around for quite a while and, and, and it still is around today that we're going to debunk. It's, it's very easily debunked from Scripture. And then the other large, even a bigger teaching than that is this concept of purgatory. And that is also going to be debunked as we go through the Scripture. And it goes back to what I was just teaching on salvation because the concept of purgatory is still this having to add works to be part of salvation. And this is big in the Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church teaches this concept of purgatory. And many people, who, who's never heard the word purgatory before? Has anyone never heard that word before? See, everyone's heard the word before. And where the word comes from, if you've never really thought about it before, it, it's very similar to the word purge. Right? Purgatory is a place where in, in the Catholic teaching, you are cleansed you are made more purified you end up being purged of your sins completely which again is teaching that what christ did was not enough that's, right. yeah. that's ultimately what it boils down to is that hey you you know and, and the catholic church will teach well most people will go to purgatory right because they'll say, you know, you still, and, and it's based on this concept of have you repented of your sins? Have you not repented of your sins? And where are you at with that when you die? And if you've done some, some small sins, some venial sins, as they call them, then you know what? You still believed in Jesus, so you're still ultimately going to go to heaven. But now we've got to add this extra process, and you're going to be in this place, and no one can really define exactly how it works. Is it hell? Is it hell-like? Is it, you what type of suffering is it where you just have to just be cleansed of this sin because the blood of Jesus Christ wasn't enough to just wash away and wash you clean and make you white as snow, apparently, if you have to go to some place that's called purgatory. But we're going to see in Scripture, and we'll get to there in a little bit, there is no such place. The Bible never talks about such a place. There's either heaven or hell that you will end up being at when you die. The Bible says first, just for kind of a definition, a biblical definition of death, the Bible says in James 2.26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Obviously, in our day, we have different medical terms for death, right? You could say maybe when your heart stops beating or when there's a lack of brain activity or things like that. You know, medical science is always trying to kind of put a, a, a point on it that we can see physically, but it's really a spiritual thing. Because when your spirit departs from your body, according to the Bible, that's when you're dead. Right. And we don't know exactly when that is. I mean, there's a lot of things that could be done trying to keep bodies alive. But I'll tell you what, and, and people who have experience with this in the medical industry will know too, you know, it's like some people, they can keep their bodies alive and keep them going. And then other people could be in almost the same exact situation. Nothing they do matters. Their body can't be kept alive. And yeah, I know you could always have some type of form of machine, but there's, it's obvious that there's, there's no life there. But um, that's because the spirit, when the spirit departs, that person's dead. That person dies. And we're going to see here in 1 Kings 17... This concept of, um, and this is, this is more debunking the soul sleep thing, because your soul does not just, you know, it's not just resting with your body. Your soul departs from your body when you die, just like your spirit does. Look at verse number 18 in 1 Kings 17. The Bible reads, And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me? to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son. 
And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And this is the story of uh, the Shunammite woman who Elijah, you know, blessed her with with you know, the pro with uh, the blessing from God that she was going to have a child. And she ended up having this child. And then all of a sudden, you know, as he's still young, he ends up dying. And she sends for Elijah to come and be like, you know, what, what's going on? You know, why are you calling my sins to remembrance? You know, just like you gave me the son and now and now he's just being killed and taken away from me. You know, and, and she she's asking him about this. But look at what it says here. It says in verse 20, uh, And he cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And you know what? I need to correct myself because this isn't a Shunammite woman. This is a different person um, that was a widow woman. And, and anyways, that's a... Let's continue out of the story because here's, here's a point I want to focus on anyways. Oh, Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. So this child was dead and his soul was departed. And he's asking God to allow that soul to re-enter the body so that he can come back to life physically on this earth. Verse 22 says, And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. That revive, reviving is him coming back to life. And it's based on his soul coming back into his body. So we see there a clear example. Your soul separates from your body when you die. When a person dies, their soul departs from the body. Turn, if you would, to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. There's another passage here that basically teaches that when we are absent from our body... We are present with the Lord for believers. This is all to show that there is no intermediate step. Now, we didn't know where the soul was of that child, but we saw that he was dead when his soul was, was departed from his body. It's not, it's not like his soul was still just resting with his body there, asleep with the body. The soul is already gone. So, we'll get into where, what happens to your soul in a minute, but I just wanted to show that there. Hey, the body is separate from the soul at death. Your soul's not even there anymore. So to think of like your soul sleep, people's souls are sleeping with their bodies in the grave or something, it's not the way it works because you're already departed from that. 2 Corinthians 5 verse number 6, the Bible reads, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. So as long as we're here, we're in our body, we are not present with the Lord, we're absent, right? Verse 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So while we're at home in our bodies here, we're absent from the Lord, but we'd much rather be absent from the body so that we can be present with the Lord. Right? And that's what he's teaching. You know, and, and Apostle Paul goes over this concept a few different times, saying, hey, you know what, it's, it's a lot better for you that I'm here but as for me, hey, I'm ready just to go and be with the Lord. Right? And I'm paraphrasing, but that's, that's the idea there is that, hey, if we, if we lose and shed this physical body, it's going to be much better for those of us that believe in Christ because then we won't have all of the sufferings and pain and the other things that go along with having this physical sinful body and we get to be with the Lord. We get to be present with the Lord. Just in His presence. How great is that? But while we're in this body, we're absent from the Lord. Flip over to Luke 16. This is kind of the main, uh, the main text or passage for the sermon. Because this is the best and most clear example that we have in Scripture of what happens to people when they die. Luke chapter 16 covers, this, this is going to cover purgatory, this will cover soul sleep, this, cover, this answers everything, this one story in Luke 16. Very, very clear story. Now, some people call this a parable. I don't believe this is a parable, and I'll tell you why, because it uses a first name. It uses a person's name. 
He was a person named Lazarus. And it talks about him being embraced by Abraham. When you read parables in Scripture, Jesus used many parables. And the Bible typically will say, He spake a parable unto them and said, and it's always generic. A sower went forth to sow, or a king went off into a foreign country, and you know, and his servant, you know, and it's always just this, this scenario that's really, really generic, right? This gives us details. Details that other parables don't give you. One, the name being a big thing, but even other, ter other, par other details. Look at verse number 19 in Luke 16. The Bible says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Fared mean he ate. He ate really well every day. He's rich. He's got his great clothing. He's eating well every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Not, there was a rich man and a poor guy, and, and, you know, here's what happened. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus. This tells me this isn't just a parable. This is a real story. But regardless, okay, even if you want to say that this is a parable, there's still truths being taught in this parable that you can't ignore. But let's keep reading. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So you've got a rich guy and you've got this beggar. And the beggar, he's like, you know what? I just want to eat the crumbs off your floor. Can, can you let me do that? And this is what he wants from the rich man. He's always asking for. And on top of that, he's got, the, he's got these sores and the dogs are licking them and making it worse. And, you know, he's just in a very miserable state here on earth. Verse 22, very important here, says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now, this, for, this verse right here, verse 22, of Lazarus dying, the beggar dying, it says he was carried by the angels. What happens to a believer when you die, and I believe this happens to every single believer that dies, is that you are carried by angels to heaven. You don't just float up there on your own. It's not something that you have the power just when you die, you just go whoosh, and you just go up like of your own accord. Think about that. I mean, if you, if you were able to do that, then why wouldn't someone who's not a believer be able to do the same thing? And the Bible even says in John chapter 3, Jesus Christ said, And no man hath ascended unto heaven but the Son of God, but he that came down from heaven, excuse me, even the Son of man which is in heaven. The Bible says no man has ascended up into heaven. And obviously people went to heaven you can, and, and, and there's plenty of examples of that, too. The Bible says, I have this later in my notes, but I'll just cover it right now, that when Elijah went to heaven, when, when he was taken of the Lord, uh, the Bible says in, in 2 Kings 2.11, And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and part of them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So these chariots of fire and horses of fire came, and they scoop up Elijah, and he goes up into heaven by a whirlwind. That's in the Old Testament. That happened prior to Jesus Christ making his statement that said, no man hath ascended up to heaven. The reason why is because that ascension that he's referring to would be something that, that the person is able to do on their own. It's not referring to just... The, the state of, of, of rising, right? Because you could think of ascension, the word ascension meaning like, well, if you're just in an elevator, you're, you're ascending, right? But that's under the power of the elevator. You're not like levitating, right? The way that, that we would understand it's probably a little bit better is just like no, no one's ever levitated in heaven. That's, when he's talking about ascending, that's what he's talking about. No one's able to, now you know who's able to do that? The son of man. <coughs> He was able to ascend into heaven. We're not. 
Okay? And that's why we need the angels to come and take us. And it makes sense, too. I mean, even in, at, the, at, the, uh, at the resurrection, what's going to happen? There's a reaping of the angels. Matthew 24, 31 says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to the other. That's the rapture. When he sends his angels to reap the harvest of the earth, to gather together the elect, the angels are doing that. So what happens to a believer when they die, your soul and your spirit depart from your body, and guess what? There's an angel there to take you to heaven. And it happens right away. There's no... There's no... Uh, uh, and, and we'll see that here, too. This is going to be proven, that there, there's no intermediate step here. This isn't something that happens, you know... Years and decades and way down the line, whenever uh, Jesus Christ comes back, it says here he's carried by the angel in Abraham's bosom. But then look at verse twenty-three. It says, "And in uh, and the rich man also was uh, died and was buried." Verse twenty-three. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So the rich man went to hell. Lazarus went to be with Abraham. Guess what? Abraham was saved, and he's in heaven. And this rich man now, it says, as soon, like, he just lifts up his eyes. He died and is buried. He's like, I'm in hell now. And he's in torments. He's not asleep. He's feeling pain. Yeah. He's being tormented. Verse 24 says, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And for people who want to say, oh no, hell is just a separation from God and it's just an anguish to not be with the Lord and that's what hell really is and it's this, this you know, just, you're so far away from God and you want to be closer and that's just punishment enough. That is not what the Bible teaches about hell at all. That's someone who teaches something that doesn't want to believe what the Bible says and doesn't know who God really is. Because this rich man says... I am tormented in this flame. The flame is torturing his soul that has descended into hell. And he's tormented so much that he's asking now. Remember that same beggar that was at his door that was full of sores and the dog was, was licking him? He wanted to eat the crumbs off the floor. He wanted to take some water off his finger. He didn't care where that finger's been anymore. He doesn't care how dirty it was or whatever. Obviously, it's not when he's in heaven, but you know, it's, it's just this, how the tables have turned now. I'll just take one drop of water because that's how tormented he was in the flame. Just, one, just give me one drop from his finger. Verse 25, But Abraham said, Son... Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they, they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And he's basically, what he's saying here is that there's this great gap, there's this great gulf that separates heaven from hell, and he says, you can't. So he's like, that way, people in heaven can't go to hell, and people in hell can't go to heaven. Just can't do it. So if he's in purgatory, well, I thought that the whole point was that, oh, you're, they're eventually going to be come out of there and end up going to heaven. It's not the case. There's this great gulf. You can't, you can't just go from one to the other. Verse 27, but this again proves that this is all happening in a short period of time. They're not asleep. Verse 27 says, they weren't asleep and then woke up at the resurrection and now that he's in hell and he's in heaven. Verse 27 says, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. He's still referring to his family's house his brethren that are still alive. Because this conversation happens right away. 
Lazarus is in heaven, he's in hell, and he's, and, and he's going, hey, I still have family that's alive. My brothers are still alive. Can you send him to them so that they don't have to come to this place? There is no gap. There is no time period. There is no purgatory, and there is no soul sleep in this story at all. And even if this is just all a parable, why would it just be contrary to the truth? If, if the truth is, no, 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 there's soul sleep. If the truth is, no, 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 there's purgatory, then why does this not have any of that, even as a parable? Parables are supposed to be teaching truths. That's a good point. Yeah. Parables don't just come up with something completely false to use as an example. You may not be able to, to get a particular truth from every aspect of a parable. You know what the point of the parable is to help relate it to you because you understand. Because, oh yeah, this all makes sense. God's not using a parable that's full of lies to teach you some truth. But if you believe in soul sleep, if you believe in purgatory, this would have to be a lie. That no, 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 things cannot happen that way. Because you're still asleep in the ground until Jesus Christ comes back. Well, that's not what happened in this story, parable or not. So you're saying that Jesus is lying. Yeah. That's not actually the way things are, but I just want to teach you something else. Why would he do that? He's not going to use a lie to teach you some truth. You can't get truth from a lie. Otherwise, you might as well, well call Satan the, the most truthful person that's ever existed. No, he, he's the father of lies. You're making Jesus satanic if you're saying that he's lying here. Yeah. But you're not believing his story if you think that people stay, stay asleep in the ground. Let's keep reading in verse number 29. The Bible says, Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And there's so much more I could preach on that, but I'm going to skip that over just for sake of time. Flip over, if you would, to Luke chapter 12. I'm actually going to close on this. Luke 16 is such a great passage, totally debunks the concept of purgatory, debunks the concept of soul sleep, and is a very, very clear picture of what happens when you die. You end up in one of two places. You're either going to be comforted and greeted with open arms. So when Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, the bosom is right here. It's his chest, it's his breast. He's, he's embracing him. What happens when you die? Do you, want, do you want to be greeted by angels who are going to carry you to heaven where you're going to be comforted? Or do you want to lift up your eyes in hell? Because that's what happens. Your body stays here. Your soul departs from your body. And it's going to one of two places. And you don't get to choose. The angels are going to take you where you are going to go. And once you're there, there's a great goal fix. There's no getting out. You know, on this earth, there's prisons, and, and you hear about these prison escapes and stuff like that, and, and people are able to get out of prison. God's prison that he made, you can't get out of. There's no escape. There is no escape possibility at all. Amen. There's no way out, and the sentence is forever. Yeah. There's no parole. There's no, oh, now I've been purged enough. Now I'm going to go to heaven. You passed on the purging. The purging is being purged from your sins through Jesus Christ. That's right. Through His blood. You have until the day you die. And for some people, if you make that decision earlier, you don't even have that choice. But once you're dead, you definitely don't have a choice anymore on where you go. So you need to get that settled now. And we need to understand that we can't take our possessions with us when we die either. People get too focused and wrapped up on all the things of this earth because when you die, your body lays in the grave, and guess what? All that stuff you've accumulated, you get no more say-so in that anymore. The best you can hope for is that, is that people honor your will that you had for your possessions, but it ain't going with you. 
That's staying here to be done with by whatever people are going to do with it. Whether they're wise or foolish, whatever. And you've got nothing to say over that when you're gone, ultimately. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, 7, For we brought nothing in this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Luke 12, look at verse number 15. The Bible reads, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods, laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. God calls that person a fool. The person who spends his time and his life and he's just managing all of his wealth and just thinking like, oh man, I know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to build these greater storehouses just to store all my stuff. And then I'm just going to live the easy life and just live off that. I've got it all figured out, all planned out. And God says, sorry, your plan isn't going to go the way that you wanted it to go because tonight your soul is required of you. You know what's more important than laying up for your physical body and physical existence here? How about you lay up for your soul's existence in eternity? How about you figure out where that's going to happen? How about you figure out what's going to happen to you when you die? Don't get so caught up and distracted into the, the covetousness of the world, into the, oh man, I just got to make this much more money and buy this much more stuff and I'll have all this happiness and all these things here to, and then I'll be set. Man, if I get to that point, I'll be set. How about you worry about getting your soul set? Getting your soul right, because you don't know what day your soul is going to be required of you. Could be today, could be tomorrow, could be in 10 years, but you know what? Your soul is going to continue forever as your body decays and rots in the ground. Your soul is much more important. Figure out where your soul is going to go. When the angels greet you, when your soul departs from your body, where is your soul going? You going to heaven? Or are they going to cast you into hell? It's easy to be saved. It's easy. It's easy. It's easy to know where you're going. Amen. It's not based on you. You got no bragging rights for salvation. Humble yourself. Accept a free gift from the Lord. He's already bought and paid for it. He paid for your sins. You trust Him. He saves you forever. You'll know where you're, what is going to happen to you when you die. You know you've got a mansion in heaven. You know because Jesus was good enough, because he paid the price, and he offered himself up a sacrifice for you. Choice is up to you. Accept it or reject it. You have no hope if you reject it. You are not good enough. Accept it. You've got nothing to worry about. Be carried by the angels in Abraham's bosom. Let's borrow have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much. Thank you so much for loving us and loving us so much that you are willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice in order to, to atone for our sins and to, and to pay for all the wrongs that we've done, Lord. And that those, those sins don't go unpunished. And they had to be punished. And we thank you for loving us enough to, to take our place that, that Jesus Christ died for us. That's so profound, Lord. I pray that you please help us to, to inform others and to show people the light of your word and your truth 
and how they could be saved and how they could go to heaven, dear Lord, and how they could know what's going to happen to them when they die. Lord, help us to, to teach that truth and to show that truth, Lord, and to um, also not to get, get carried away in any weird false doctrines of these purgatory and soul sleep and anything else that's going to, um, that's contrary to what your word says. I pray that you would please help us to, to make these truths clear unto others, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.